stuff. Anyway, um, I wish to extend my own personal thanks to GM3 New Zealand and its supporters for the invitation to visit, to come to New Zealand. My very first, my first time here in your wonderful country. I'm just sad that I can't spend uh, time here to 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 really enjoy and get to know your country. But I hope to come back again. And I want to thank you all for coming here this evening uh, as well uh, to, um, to hear our message. What I um, hope to do this evening is to build on what, Dr. what you heard from Dr. Michel to give you a little bit more mechanistic insight, perhaps, into some of the conditions that she described she is seeing in, uh, in her in the, the, the patients, her children, patients, which no doubt are, are prevalent even in adults uh, as well. And I'm going to do it from the back, my background of uh, molecular biology. Uh, I've been studying human gene structure and function for many years, and more recently using those discoveries to develop gene-based medicines for human gene therapy applications. And part of parcel of that research is of course using genetic engineering technology. So I'm, I'm very familiar with how genetic engineering is conducted. I've used genetically modified organisms that range from viruses <coughs> to mice. So I, I just, and so I know what the impact <coughs> is of introducing trans, trans genes, foreign genes into organisms, what that entails and what the outcomes are. And whereas somebody like me, People uh, like myself in the clinical sphere, uh, we conduct our work under what we call contained use applications. That means we do not release any genetically modified organisms into the environment that can replicate and spread. That would not be a good thing because that would, uh, the consequences are unknown. We, have, we respect that the genetic engineering process is not precise and that there are inherent unpredictable components. So we need to use the technology wisely, responsibly, in a contained manner. For targeted applications, when I look across to the agricultural sector, where very similar technologies are being used, and where, well, to be honest, if I'm to put it bluntly, it seems to be a free-for-all, where genes are introduced into Various organisms, it's not just plants, but even bacteria and viruses have been engineered for release into the environment in an agricultural setting. And I'm horrified at this very slapdash approach, really. And I'll, why, and why I have that view, I hope to elaborate uh, this evening. I won't have time to go into the technical aspects of genetically modified organisms and their associated pesticides because of the time constraints. Um, so if you wish to follow up the issues that I will raise in greater detail, I recommend you go to the Earth Open Source website and download a free copy of our report, GMO Myths and Truths. It's a report that we launched last summer, I'm co-author on this, and where you, it's a, a reference that gives you an evidence-based evaluation of the claims of safety and efficacy of GM crops. Why should we be worried about GM foods? Because after all, our governments, our regulators are saying, oh, don't worry, this technology is very precise, it's been proven safe, and therefore uh, we, we should just eat it and not worry. Which maybe brings me to a point where I'd like to ask a question. How many of you here would, uh, based on what you know, and, and please don't be shy to when you respond, how many of you here would be happy to eat GM foods? Now oh, we've got a few, and, and I don't blame you. You know, we should have, you know, if our, we've got trust in our regulators, they're there to serve, to serve us, they're there, they're, they've got our safety, first and foremost, uh, in mind, so if they say they're safe, then why shouldn't we eat them and not worry? Well, I, I, as you are, I'm going to be quite critical of regulatory agencies through my talk uh, this evening, and I, and I hope I can say enough to show you 
well, I, well, I have some of my criticisms are justified. But what is it about GM foods that uh, I feel could give cause for concern and maybe contributing, as Dr. Perot before me hinted, to the conditions that she is seeing in her patients? Well, to, if I was to encapsulate the key features of the GM transformation process that make it radically different from normal methods, normal natural reproduction, normal cross-pollination, sexual reproduction methods of producing crops, it would be this, that GM allows the transfer of genes between totally unrelated organisms. So you can move genes from viruses, from bacteria, from animals and unrelated plants into crop plants. And that process involves the random insertion of an artificial gene unit into the crop. So as a result, this brings about combinations of genes that have not evolved to work together in a harmonious manner. Why is that important? At the time when GM crops were first began to be conceived and generated, back in the early 1980s, we knew virtually nothing about the complexities of how genes are organized within, within the DNA of an organism, including humans, of course, and more importantly, how those genes are regulated, how they're controlled. And so therefore, they were very much treated as isolated units of information, like Lego bricks, that you can move around, slot them in, in a totally, with a totally predictable outcome. That is the way genes are treated in generating GM plants, transgenic plants. That is no longer, you know, our understanding of genetics uh, has now advanced to the point where that view, that conception is just totally flawed. Genes do not work as isolated units of information. They work as part of, they work in families, and families work together. In other words, genes are, every gene is part of a very sophisticated, integrated network of function. So the context in which a gene exists, as much as the information that it contains, is, is part and parcel of its identity and, and purpose. So when you take a gene, even from a bacteria, and you insert it <coughs> in a random fashion into a plant, you're taking a gene and putting it into a new context, a new environment, with, in other words, in the context of other genes with which it has not evolved to work in a harmonious, balanced manner. So that's the first source of concern from fundamental genetics, my own field of investigation. The second aspect, so just to summarize that, GM brings about combinations of genes, new combinations of genes, crossing species barriers in the vast majority of situations, and which, uh, as a result, genes which have not evolved to work harmoniously together. The second point about the GM transformation process is that it is not precise. It is, causes mutation, damage to the DNA during the process. Two levels of damage, two principal levels of damage. One is the insertion of the GM gene will disrupt one or more gene functions. And secondly, the process of the overall process of GM transformation causes random damage throughout the DNA of the plant. Hundreds or thousands of points of damage within the DNA of the plant. Many of these points of damage will carry through to the marketed product. So at the end of the day, the combined effects of GM, the mutational effect of the GM transformation process, and the novel combinations of genes, of gene products, will always, to a lesser or greater degree, disrupt the genetic and bio protein biochemical function of the plant. And that in turn, if you disrupt the biochemistry, that in turn can lead to the generation of novel new toxic effects, allergies, and also nutritional value. And this is why I feel GM crops need to be evaluated for their safety in a very generic manner. And especially, not only for acute toxicity, but especially what impact they may have uh, on a long-term consumption basis. But they're highly regulated. It is claimed that those who are endorsed GM crop technology, they 
they say they're the most highly regulated foods ever produced by mankind and that their regulatory evaluation has passed them as being perfectly safe. So again, should we be worried if the regulator says they are safe? Well, unfortunately, there isn't an all-binding international regulatory framework for the evaluation of the safety of GM foods. So what we have at the moment is that the regulatory agencies around the world are highly varied. In the United States, GM crops are basically deregulated, and a company can market a product with virtually no safety evaluation at all. In Europe, we're supposed to have the world's strictest <coughs> GM safety evaluation. Where you know, and, and some analysis is required. Some safety analysis is required. Uh, here in uh, New Zealand and Australia, I know share uh, your food safety regulatory agency, uh, and I think it falls somewhere in between in terms of its what it does uh, between Europe and the United States. But for me, regardless of what energy agency we talk about, they're all grossly inadequate, and they're inadequate on many many levels, I just list a few here that for me are, are, are key inexcusable uh, deficiencies. One is that all agencies fail to fundamentally question the technology in the way that I introduced it at the beginning. They fail to uh, place the technology in our ever advancing basic science of genetics because if they did, they would realise that what may have been a good idea 20, 30 years ago isn't any longer. Because the basic science tells you that the genes, you can't treat genes as isolated units of information. So the technology, no regulatory agency ever fundamentally questions the technology per se. Secondly, the only safety data when requested, like it is in, in, in Europe, is, is uh, provided only by the developer company. No independent evaluation of a GM food, independent of the company that wishes to market this product, is ever done, is ever taken into account by a regulatory agency. Any analysis of the GM food is very superficial in terms of its composition. No detailed, in-depth analysis, and that's inexcusable because we have technologies today that can literally take apart an organism and give us a complete gene, gene expression, protein profile, and small molecule profile. So this concept of substantial equivalence uh, that is there to support safety of GM foods is totally flawed. And lastly, and I think this is a, a, a major, uh, my most major concern, and that stems from the fact that the GM, the unpredictability of the technology is not fully acknowledged by regulators, is that there is no requirement by any regulatory agency for, to evaluate the consumption of GM foods on a long-term basis. And what do I mean by long term? At least two years. If, if a developer company provides any safety data at all, as it, as it sometimes does and when it applies for approval in Europe, it's for just 90 days feeding studies in rats maximum. Sometimes it's even less. 90 days of a lifetime of a rat is about seven, eight years life in a human. But the regulator extrapolates from this 90 days to a lifelong, the safety implication on a lifelong basis. I'm afraid that isn't science. That's <laughs> not being true to the science at all. It's not science whatsoever. What could be the sources of GM foods and that could be contributing to escalating illness in society? There are three sources for me that uh, the three, you know, there's more than this, but these are the three, I feel, the most uh, key sources of potential health risks from the consumption of GM foods. First of all, the product of the introduced GM gene, the, the foreign GM gene, or trans gene, as we call it. And, for example, many crops, about 20% of GM crops, are engineered to express an insecticide called BT toxin. Uh, BT toxin. Bt toxin is actually ex uh, exists in, in nature. It comes uh, in a class of bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, hence the term Bt toxin. And Bt toxins extracted from these bacteria can be used as natural insecticides by conventional and organic farms. They have a very selective 
in, you know, they will target certain insects and not harm others. BT toxin is a, uh, is a potential health risk because the way it's engineered into a GM food is very different to how it exists in the bacteria and how it can be extracted and used as a natural insecticide. And so with that comes not new health uh, risk. Secondly, as we heard from Dr. Michelle again before me, that in fact most GM crops, about 80% of them, are engineered to tolerate application of herbicides. In particular, the glyphosate-based herbicides, the most, the most common of which is Roundup. What, that mean, what does that mean? It means that you and I, as the consumer, will get exposed to high residue levels of these herbicides, these pesticides in, in the foods that's derived from them. <coughs> What is the, what is the, is there a negative health impact from that? Well, maybe you've heard enough, but I'll provide you with some more evidence that, uh, that actually things may be even worse. And lastly, the, 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 another source of health risk is from what I mentioned before, which is that due to the effect of the GM transformation process, the novel, the disturbed biochemistry of the plant, that results from the GM transformation process can produce novel toxic and allergic effects. I will now briefly summarise for you some of the evidence that shows that there are, is evidence from controlled laboratory animal feeding studies that shows that health risks can arise from one or a combination of those three sources that I just mentioned. Controlled animal feeding studies conducted both by academic, academic scientists and even, if you look carefully at the industry studies conducted for, as part of their application for marketing approval, on crops engineered to express both the BT toxin and the glyphosate, and sometimes we have to remember that many crops are engineered to combine both, many GM crops like corn, they are expressed BT toxin and they're tolerant to glyphosate application, Roundup application. And studies involving both soy and corn, there's an increasing body of evidence to show that consumption of these foods can lead to multiple organ and system damage, liver and especially affecting liver and kidney function, immune system function, including allergic type reactions, and digestive system problems uh, resulting in various types of lesions. This uh, is a very busy slide. I'll put it up just to show you, illustrate some of the studies that give cause for concern. Industry studies with BT, maize and corn, uh, even after just 90 days of exposure, show signs of toxicity, especially to liver and kidney function. Studies with rats, mice, Pigs, ewes, and rats have shown disturbances to liver and kidney function, to multiple immune system disturbances, and uh, organ, multiple organ damage, especially to liver and kidney. And you'll note that that study at the bottom uh, with Monet 10 BT core, the authors of that study found serious health, uh, serious damage in structure, function, especially the liver, kidney, testes and intestines, following just 91 days of consumption of their animals. So, so some of these products can lead to uh, serious health impacts, even on a short-term basis. So that is one source of, uh, maybe I'll just go back. I should say, what, what, could we have, what is the cause uh, of, of this? The studies aren't deep enough, uh, broken up enough to know whether it's the BT toxin in the crop or whether there's damage from the GM transformation process that is causing this toxicity. We cannot distinguish on the basis of these studies which is the source. But we have to, what we could bear in mind is that BT toxin is an immunogen. It will call, we will mount an immune response against BT toxin. And BT toxin is known to be as an immunological adjuvant. What does that mean? It means that BT toxin can heighten an immune reaction against other food products. To me, with enough exposure, this could be a recipe for generating allergic reactions. One, one mechanism of BT toxin. 
the other uh, aspect of source of toxicity I wish to focus on, uh, stemming from GM crops, is this heightened exposure to glyphosate-based herbicides. This is glyph the molecule glyphosate, we've seen that before. It is the world's most used pesticide, used on, at on uh, around 80% of GM crops, and you need to tolerate it. A gene from bacteria has been introduced into these crops, which allows it to withstand its application. The majority of GM soy is engineered to uh, resist glyphosate-based herbicide application. So therefore, it's not surprising to find worryingly large quantities of glyphosate in, uh, when, in GM soy. The figures at the bottom that you see there uh, of this slide is uh, residues of glyphosate and its primary degradation product, AMPA, in uh, USA GM soy. If New Zealand is sourcing GM soy from North America, this is the, for its animal feed, for example, this is what you can expect to be present in the soy. If you're sourcing from Argentina or Brazil, studies have shown that some batches uh, coming from South America can push up to 100 milligrams per kilogram of soy. <laughs> But glyphosate-based herbicides are safe, aren't they? How many of us here use Roundup in, in our gardens? Yeah, good. I'm not surprised. It's very effective. <laughs> and perhaps you look like these people, you know. They're, they're not wearing any protective clothing, no gloves, no masks, short sleeves, and they very, seem to be very happy using it because it's very effective. And why should we be, and I wouldn't blame you if that's the way you used it, because the regulator says that glyphosate is safe. Roundup is safe. So why should you be worried? Of course it is. Well, the worry, the worry begins when you look at safety studies of uh, GM crops that are engineered to tolerate application of glyphosate, Roundup. Industry studies show signs of toxic effects to liver and kidney function even after 90 days of consumption of the GM corn in, the, in this study. And academic work, uh, work by Manuela Malatesta in Italy, who studied toxic effects stemming from GM, Roundup tolerant GM soy, have shown disturbed liver, pancreas, and testis function over a relatively short period of time. But, and when she extended the study to 24 months, the mice showed far more acute signs of aging in their liver. Where the question is, what's, uh, what's causing these toxic effects? Is it the GM process or the Roundup residues in the feed? Good question. The, but if we look at, uh, again, we, we're told that Roundup and glyphosate is relatively safe. These are the and uh, what the regulator sets for us is an acceptable daily intake. What you and I, what, it, what the regulator says, you and I can consume on a daily basis, day in, day out, and that we will suffer no adverse effects. In Australia, uh, sorry, in the European Union and Australia, I don't know what it is here in New Zealand, the regulator says that we can consume 0.3 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day and, I'll be, and we'll be fine. For somebody of my weight, that's a little over 20 milligrams per day of glyphosate every day. In China and Russia, it's one milligram per kilogram per day. And in the USA, where clearly people are much of much tougher <laughs> stock. <laughs> um, the regulator there says that they can consume 1.75 milligrams per kilogram per day. That means if I move from Europe to America, I can eat more and I'll still be safer. <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? Uh, well, you, you laugh, but it is a laughing matter because these regulators are supposed to be arriving at these safe levels of consumption on the basis of the same scientific evidence. So how can one agency arrive at one number and another and comes to another number? Already suspicion is, is arises. So, so the fundamental question is, are these exposures really safe? When, when a group, uh, I was part of a group of scientists that actually looked at the evidence, the scientific evidence that the European Union used to set its value of 0.3 milligrams, the one that we have here, that's in Australia as well. And we came to the conclusion on the basis, on looking at the same data, that they'd set it at least three times too high, because they ignored some teratogenic birth defect effects in some animals studies. 
but is it, but is that is that reducing it by a third to three times low? Is that safe? We've heard that glyphosate has multiple sources of toxicity from Dr. Perot before me, from Michelle. It's, it's a, a patented antibiotic. It's a very potent nutrient metal chelator. At certain doses, it damages DNA. But the, the latest evidence, which worries me most is uh, at the moment, is that there is increasing evidence to show that glyphosate is also an endocrine disruptive chemical. In other words, it can interfere with hormonal function in our bodies, certain hormones. We all know what hormones are. Insulin is a hormone, growth hormone is a hormone, and steroids. We have steroid hormones. And when men and women have different classes of hormones as well, women have more estrogen, men have more testosterone. Hormones are crucial. Balanced hormonal functioning, functioning is absolutely vital for good health because they control just about every organ bodily function. Imbalances in hormone function can result in serious ill health. Is, what is the, is there, if you go to the Monsanto website, however, you will find that, as, as you will read at the bottom there, that the company claims that there is no evidence of endocrine disruption arising from glyphosate. The question is, are there, is the scientific evidence supportive of that? Before I answer that question with you, I just want to spend just a few minutes talking about endocrine disruptive chemicals. Endocrine disruptive, why are they such a worry? And this includes agricultural chemicals and unfortunately chemicals in the households. Endocrine disruptive chemicals are a worry because they can work at very low doses and, and in a non-linear way, which means that a level set by a regulator, a low level exposure level set by a regulator may not be safe, may be in that endocrine disruptive range. And endocrine disruption begins virtually from conception. So the fetus, effects of endocrine disruption can affect the fetus and the consequences of that may not manifest until after life. Because what, what these endocrine disruptive chemicals do, and if I had another hour I'd go into it in great detail, is that it sets up a, what, what we know as epigenetic changes in the fetus. Epigenetics is what controls the genetics. The genes are regulated. Epigenetics are layers of gene control that sit on the DNA. And these are, again, a balanced epigenetic control is vital for balanced gene function and health. If you disturb the epigenetic control, and that's carried forward in life, later on it can lead to serious ill health. And so the events of endocrine disruption in the womb do not stay in the womb. They are carried on in life by the child that is born. Why is it a worry? Because no regulator in the world today acknowledges the endocrine disruptive effect of chemicals and, inclu and includes it in its safety evaluation of chemicals, of any agricultural chemical and, and household chemicals. That is the worry. They ignore the EDC potential in toxicity evaluation of chemicals. And if you ignore them, these are the spectrum of diseases that can arise. Hormone-related cancers, learning disabilities, ADHD, infertility, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, autoimmunity, asthma, and autism, etc. Here is a graphic illustration of what I've been saying. The mouse on the left, as you look at it, has been born from a mother who's drank normal, normal water. The mouse on the right, as you look at that slide, has been born of a mother that had one part per billion of an endocrine disruptive chemical called bisphenol A in her drinking water, resulting in this marked obesity. Hence, a lot of these endocrine disruptive chemicals have been termed as obesogens. And all classes of pesticides are now known to have endocrine disruptive activity at very low levels. And, uh, and this, of course, can result in uh, costing billions of dollars, euro, whatever, in health costs. What is the evidence for glyphosate or Roundup as an endocrine disruptive chemical? 
There are many studies that indicate that glyphosate Roundup can interfere with multiple hormonal systems. But the ones that convince me at the moment that there is definitely an effect there that we need to look into in great detail are summarized on this slide here. Retinoic acid is vitamin A, which we all know we need for good eyesight. But retinoic acid, just like vitamin D, vitamin A, sorry, like vitamin D, can also act as a hormone type substance. And retinoic acid is particularly important during fetal development. If retinoic acid is disrupted during fetal development, it can give rise to birth defects. And work conducted by Professor Carrasco in Argentina showed that glyphosate and Roundup cause disruption of retinoic acid and birth defects in the frog and chick model systems that he used. And the kinds of defects, birth defects he found in these animals was exactly what is found in the Argentinian population in the rural areas, escalating birth defects arising from the increasing use of Roundup in conjunction with GM soy cultivation. And then we have some very convincing data that glyphosate can interfere with estrogen. In particularly, a number of studies that show that estrogen can mimic, sorry, glyphosate can mimic the effects of, of estrogen and that it can augment its function. And, and in particular, it can cause growth proliferation of human breast cancer cells. Breast cancer is hormone dependent and independent. Women who uh, have unfortunate to have hormone dependent breast cancer, they will be given tamoxifen to try to block the effect of the estrogen. Glyphosate can mimic the effect of estrogen. And there is evidence to suggest that it's only preliminary, so we must take this with extreme caution, that glyphosate can interfere with uh, or can augment human breast cancer cell growth through uh, in a manner which is not blocked by tamoxifen. But certainly, glyphosate can promote human breast cancer cell growth from these laboratory studies, as well as lead to organ damage. Adjuvants uh, are another worry in these pesticide mixtures. A pesticide is not just a single chemical, it is a complex mixture of chemicals. If you just spray glyphosate on a plant, nothing happens, because the glyphosate can't get into the plant to kill it. So the manufacturer mixes in a whole range of different other organic substances that punch holes into the plant cell wall, allow the glyphosate to get in and uh, kill the plant. These adjuvants are present in all pesticides, all classes of pesticides, and some classes of adjuvants are now being found to, which are claimed to be inert by the way, all classes of adjuvants are claimed to be inert, but there's increasing laboratory studies that show that adjuvants, some classes of adjuvants, are even more toxic than the stated active ingredient. So some classes of adjuvants are up to 800 times more toxic than glyphosate alone. Why is that a worry? No regulator evaluates the adjuvants for toxicity. This is a study released last week from a group at uh, Flinders University of Australia, which again confirms that Roundup is more toxic than glyphosate. It can cause the death of human placental cells at much lower doses than glyphosate alone and at concentrations of glyphosate that are allowed in Australian drinking water. If you um, look at what's in the human population, very few studies have looked at what is in us as a human population in terms of glyphosate residues. But they are there, they will be in you, as they will be in me. And the question is whether the residues that are found are safe or not. They can range from one part per billion in urine to up to near 20, 20 parts per billion in urine. The 20 parts is in the United States where they're exposed to much more. At the moment, the regulator is ignoring this body, but you know, this evidence as being of any significance because it's below their regulatory set safe limit. The question, of course, is are they right in what they have said as, as, as safe? In this study, if you look at the top right panel here, you have the residues in German, German people. A study conducted by Monica Kruger, a scientist in eastern Germany. And there's about two parts per billion in the urine of Germans in her region. Is that uh, 
in the lower side here, oh, I should say, of course, the, um, again, going back to the top right, people on organic diets had statistically significant lower levels of glyphosate in their urine than those on conventional diets. So there's one direction again, you know, if you want to avoid it, go organic. In the lower part there, you have uh, an interesting study in dairy cows. If, if I focus your attention on the top right, uh, the lower panel at the top right, you'll see the levels in German cows, about 20 parts per million in their urine, because they're eating GM feed, they're eating GM soy, GM corn that's imported into Europe that has glyphosate residues in it. The worrying thing is when you look at the, uh, the lower panel there, panel C, where is the levels of glyphosate in the same dairy cows? And you may not see it in detail, but actually you find about the same amount of glyphosate in the organs of these animals, that's the, uh, the liver, the kidney, the lungs, the muscle, the intestines, and the spleen. That includes parts of that cow that people eat, the muscle about the same level of glyphosate. That, and this is two effects, two things to take home from this. One is that the regulators claim that glyphosate is quickly cleared from our bodies and it will never build up. What you find in the urine will always be much higher than what's in the body. That study says they're wrong. That there is evidence for accumulation of glyphosate in the body. And the second is, of course, if you eat meat from animals that have been fed on Roundup contaminated feed, you will be eating glyphosate as well. Not just from the plant products, but from the meat products as well. Milk, dairy products as well, by the way. Not just from meat, from dairy products too. There is just one study that has looked to see directly whether these really low levels of exposure to glyphosate, that may be in our drinking water as well, uh, may, uh, what the toxic effects of that are. And it's this study from Professor Serenini's lab caused a huge controversy when it was first published in 2012, and then uh, it was retracted by the original journal uh, for totally spurious reasons, which I won't go into now, and then it was republished uh, uh, last year. Long-term toxicity study for the Roundup herbicide and Roundup tolerant genetically modified maize. Designed to extend Monsanto's 90-day feeding study with the same GMO core. And it also included this component where it looked at Roundup formulation consumption in drinking water. And I focus your attention on that lowest dose. 0.1 part per billion of round, uh, dilution of the Roundup in drinking water given a glyphosate concentration of 50 nanograms per litre. That's 50 parts per trillion. Why did he choose that? It's what we may find in contaminated drinking water in Europe. I don't know what it would be here, but it's, that's why he chose it, to see if, uh, what would be the effect of this level of contamination in European drinking water. The study that caused the furore within the industry uh, and the regulatory systems, because it found that both the, the GMO corn, the GMO corn spread with Roundup, and the Roundup, even at this lowest dose of exposure, all caused uh, uh, harm, clear toxic effects. So there was an escalation of the signs of liver and kidney damage seen in Monsanto's 90-day feeding trial, and this led to liver and kidney damage and failure, especially in the males resulting, the male animals resulting in premature death. There was a testosterone and estrogen imbalance uh, suggesting endocrine disruptive effects, as there was pituitary damage in the female in the female rats. And there was also un totally unexpectedly an increase in the tum mammary tumour incidence in the female cohort. With, this is the result from the lowest dose roundup group, this 50 parts per trillion glyphosate. The black line you see there is the increased tumour incidence extending out to the two year period of this study uh, in the control group. The red line there is the <coughs> mammary tumour incidence in the 50 part per trillion dose animals much higher levels of mammary tumours, and that is statistically significant. Therefore, I'm, I was not, in a way, surprised to find that, based on a collection of studies, not just the one I just mentioned to you, but a, a paper that came out earlier this week, which again has caused a lot of upset within the, within the industry, a pub paper published by the World Health Organization International Agency for Research on Cancer, 
They, start, they evaluated the carcinogenic cancer-causing potential of five organophosphate pesticides, and you'll see glyphosate was one of them. And what they concluded was, as you can see at the bottom there, the glyphosate was ranked based on animal, study, animal toxicity studies that uh, they concluded that glyphosate can be ranked as a grade 2A carcinogen, cancer-causing agent. Grade 2A, what does that mean? The, the grades go 1, 2A, 2B, 3, and 4. So glyphosate was ranked just one below. 1 is definite carcinogen. 2A is probable carcinogen. That is very worrying conclusion that they've come to. And the, the damage that was found in the rats in Professor Serini's study is happening at incredibly low doses, as I mentioned. Half the dose that's permitted in European Union drinking water, 14,000 times lower than what's permitted in USA drinking water, and 20,000 times lower than what the Australian drinking water guidelines of 2011 say are okay in water in that nation. I don't know what they are here. We can discuss that. But if you look at what, the, what these rats were consuming on a daily basis that resulted in these multiple organ damage an increased trend in mammary tumours, they are literally tens to hundreds of thousands of times below what the acceptable daily intake set by our regulators anywhere in the world. What could be causing it? I believe that a component, in addition to what we can add to the spectrum of sources of toxicity from glyphosate, endocrine disruption, and we're doing more work to try and, and, and uh, nail that. So, is Monsanto right to say that there is no evidence of endocrine disruption? I think we can put a very big question mark over that. <coughs> are our regulators, are these levels of acceptable daily intake really safe, set by regulators around the world? I think we can put a big question mark over that. Because I believe that even based on the current evidence alone, and there are gaps there, so we need to do more, nevertheless, based on the current evidence at the moment alone, I don't believe that a safe dose of glyphosate or Roundup is known today. It's an unknown quantity, a safe level of exposure. And so we need, we need to take this in, uh, on board and, and change things, like, like withdraw it from the market, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a life scientist. I'm a, I'm a health scientist, you know. I, I don't care about my company profits. I put the safety of, you know, safety is paramount. How are we going to get it withdrawn? Well, we can discuss that later. But Feed it to the science. That's an afternoon. You'll hear a lot about it from Zen after this, so let's hold on to that. In terms of the, the GMOs, I hope I've also given you sufficient evidence, and I've only covered some of the data. Believe me, there's more. Go to our GMO Medicine Truths if you want a more comprehensive uh, evaluation of the evidence that GMOs, GMO foods, uh, there is increasing evidence to show that the GM transformation process can gives clear signs of toxicity, especially to liver and kidney function, on a short term as well as on a long term basis. And the sources of this toxicity can be multiple. The GMG products, such as VT toxin, the herbicide residues, glyphosate in particular, and the mutagenic effects of the GM transformation process. There is evidence that these uh, 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 that toxic effects observed can arise from a combination of all of these. And therefore, we need to confirm or refute these observations in long-term animal feeding studies. And that I believe, even based on the evidence, again, as we have it now, is that no GMO crop and food can be categorically stated as safe to consume, especially on a long-term, lifelong basis. And that any claims that there is a consensus on the safety of GM foods, that the debate is over and that we should simply embrace them and welcome them are totally unfounded. Uh, there is no scientific consensus on GMO food safety. Thank you very much. Same question again, because I know some people put up their eyes. I don't know if I've convinced you or not, but I'm very, very curious. Those of, those of you who felt before I spoke that they'd be quite happy to eat GM food, how
How many now maybe have some doubts? Who would have doubts? Thank you very much. <laughs>